Gaff. God's Army to Purge Homosexuality. A private investigator and a bodyguard are asked to go undercover to infiltrate a terrorist group. Nothing out of the ordinary here, except for the private investigator is gay and the bodyguard is lesbian. And the terrorist's sole purpose is to eradicate homosexuals in the United States. Can the pair stop the madman who leads the group before they kill hundreds or thousands of people? Book Lovers Unite. I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Today, I'll be speaking with B. Allen Bourgeois, whose books are as interesting as his name. He's a really good guy. And today, he'll be reading from his book entitled Gaff, God's Army to Purge Homosexuality. Allen is also the founder and director of the Texas Association of Authors. So we'll definitely be talking about that and a lot more in this episode. And it begins right now. The Atlanta Street was bustling with activity as cars drove by and people walked up and down the sidewalks on either side. Many were going in and out of the local lesbian bar. With the holidays left behind and people beginning the ritual of thawing out, this particular Friday evening was busier than usual. A dark-haired man in his mid-twenties, looking nervous and anxious, walked to the front door of the club. He hesitated before entering, looking back down both sides of the street to see if anyone was watching him. All he saw was a white car parked across the street, his companion sitting in the driver's seat waiting for him. The young man knew that while the chances of being watched did exist, the odds were very low and highly doubtful this one evening. He also knew that after tonight he would become a part of history, the type of history generally listed as a footnote to the larger and more important events of the time. For him, though, he was the big picture of the history at that moment. So caution was the word for the night. Nothing was to stop him. The man had never been in a gay or lesbian bar before. When he was finally inside, he found it made him sick, nauseated. But strangely, at the same time, he was fascinated by what he saw. Men were kissing men, and women were kissing women. It was so abnormal to him, he couldn't help watch. As he moved around, trying to find a discreet place to put down the package that was tucked inside his backpack. It was his little gift to those repulsive, disgusting freaks of nature. Finally, he saw a glass door leading out to a patio where there were tables and stools around them. He saw a table in the corner with one stool and it was empty. It was perfect for him to sit at while killing time, waiting for that magic moment when he could give his gift properly. He placed his knapsack under the stool and sat down to watch the men and women talk to and fondle each other. Actually, the bar itself didn't seem to be any different from the straight ones he'd been to. Only the people on this one were different. He looked at his watch. It read 12.55 a.m., almost 1 o'clock. The time determined after weeks of surveillance to be the best time for what he and the other members of his group had decided would be the best way to send a message to two separate groups, the abortionist and the queers. Sweat began to run down the young man's face, a clear sign he was nervous about what he was about to do. The patio crowd thinned out due to the cold wind picking up. And yet the man sweated like it was summer, and the sun was beating down only on him. Looking around, he slowly and carefully slid off the stool, bending down to his backpack. He opened the top, just enough to slide a hand in, and flipped a switch which activated a timer. He began ticking down the one minute he had to leave the bar safely before everyone noticed his little present. Satisfied that the timer was working, and with 50 seconds to go, he pushed the backpack further under the stool, Casually, he stood up, and then he headed out to the street. Just as he stepped out the front door, he heard the gift opening up. Boom! One large pulsating sound, then a brief second of silence before the screaming and panic set in. The man who delivered the bomb gift got into the waiting car. They drove away from the scene quickly and without a care. Within minutes, the bar was emptied. People helped the injured with first aid as they waited for the ambulances and the fire trucks to arrive. One by one, the police, the fire department, EMS, and even the Red Bomb Squad vehicle arrived, followed by several news vans that simply pulled in around the emergency vehicles. 
The lights flashing from the multicolored strobes on these vehicles and the white lights of the camera crews blinded everyone in front of them. The terrorists were gone, but his companion had left another package for the emergency crews to find at just the right moment. Luckily, it was found by the rescue team. Before the terrorists left Georgia, heading west on Interstate 20, they switched vehicles four times to make sure the police couldn't catch them. They had been prepared, and they were confident that their job had been done successfully. It would actually be several days before they found out just how well they'd done. Instead of my normal advertisements this week, I wanted to take a moment to give my sincere condolences to the victims and the families of the Orlando shooting that occurred last night. Why does this keep happening? Whether it's international terrorism or domestic terrorism. These hate crimes have to stop, not only against the gay community, but against people of color and against immigrants and against so many others that we don't hear about because it doesn't make it to the mainstream media. It's ironic and ridiculous that this hate crime occurred right when this episode was scheduled to air. It feels like the perennial one step forward, two steps back. As a straight man, I support the gay community for a very simple reason. Think about your significant other right now. Your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. And then imagine society told you it was wrong to love that person. That you were an abomination. How would that make you feel? And how would you feel if you were attacked every day because of the person you love. You'd be miserable. I'd be miserable. So why would I force that on somebody else? It breaks my heart. Every time I receive an alert like this on my phone or I see a headline flash across my TV screen. People, this has to stop. We are intelligent and compassionate human beings, and we can do better than this. We are better than this. My heart, my thoughts, and my prayers go out to all of you. Okay, I am sitting here today with B. Allen Bourgeois, prolific writer, a lot of titles under your belt. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. Let's just jump right into it. Who or what exactly is GAF? They kind of sound like a domestic terrorist organization inside your story. Uh, they very much are. Um, GAF stands for God's Army to Purge Homosexuality. Now, while that particular title does not exist in the terrorist network, God's Army actually does exist, and it has for well over 20 years now. On Saturday, February 22, 1997, a group known as the Army of God took responsibility for an act of terrorism that had happened on the night before at a bar known as The Other Side. This particular bar, located in Atlanta, Georgia, was owned by a lesbian and was frequented by many lesbians and gay men. The owner's brother ran an abortion clinic that had been bombed a month before by the same group. And the person who actually did the bombing, I'm not going to give his name because I don't want to give him more credit, he was captured, he was prosecuted for the abortion clinics and the killing of doctors, but he was never um, sentenced for the gay bombing. They kind of just really? pushed it under the carpet. And in fact, CNN was one of the ones that covered the event that evening, and so did a couple of the major news stations. But by the following morning, it had disappeared. That in itself was what pissed me off and made me write the book. Which was my next question. What was it that prompted you the lack of coverage or the attitude towards it? Not only the lack of coverage, but the fact that people just don't understand we are like everybody else. Even now, um, when the aspect of approval for gay and lesbians has definitely gone over 50%, there are still that 30, 40% that sees us as these creatures that should never exist. There has been significant progress in recent years within the LG... I actually call it the Let's Buy Gay. The Let's Buy Gay. Um, I actually co coined that terminology prior to the event um, back in 94 when I did a gay event in Houston. 
Um, it was intended to refer to supporting the gay community by buying gay and lesbian biz, um, products or businesses. So Let's Buy Gay covered everybody at that point in time. Um, and so that's why I u still use it today. Okay, we'll use that term for this one. So there has been significant progress in Let's Buy Gay. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Do you feel that the climate right now in the country is the same as it was back then during the bombing or has gotten better? Um, in many ways, it has gotten better. But I also see that we are going to be facing that backlash of the Supreme Court approving gay marriage. You see it right now in the politics with Trump and you know the people that he draws to him. Not only are they bullies towards other races, but also towards the gay community, towards almost anybody that is not like them. Trump has definitely given people that encouragement to be more out there and more physical and more violent. And that definitely concerns me for the gay and lesbian community. I think overall we are in a better place on a social economic aspect that we will be able to come out of it much better. So your lead characters, Brent and Nicole, are pretty much ordinary people, but yet they find themselves in this extraordinary situation where they're literally infiltrating a hate group. Was that a difficult perspective to write from as far as what they would experience and the type of hatred they would encounter? I wouldn't say it was difficult um, to write from that experience, but it definitely pulled me into dealing with my own emotion. I had to challenge myself to understand myself better and how I would act and react in certain situations. I viewed myself as much as I could to be Brent, an average gay man that really wasn't out there sashaying down the road. Let's put it that way. That was what was critical for me. I wanted people to see all my characters in the books as average, everyday people. There are a lot of gay men and, and a lot of lesbians. You would not have any clue that they were gay or lesbian unless they told you. And that is what it's all about. Um, we should not be stereotyping ourselves or allowing the media to stereotype us in a certain way because we just don't fit that. Yes, it's great for their publicity for their money-making machines, but in reality, it's very harmful. You don't find too many stories nowadays where you have gay protagonists that find themselves in relatable stories that we can all identify with. Everybody knows how it feels to confront evil. I mean, we all watch Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. But putting those type of characters... Um, within a familiar setting, I feel shows their humanity, shows that, you know, we're all one in the same. Exactly. And that was my overall goal, good and bad. Even for the person who leads this organization, I tried to make him look human as much as I possibly could and to explain why he is doing what he's doing. And you have plans of turning Gaff into a trilogy, correct? Oddly enough, yes. It wasn't intended that way. I wrote the first one. Um, there's a cliffhanger at the end of book two that will be used as the opening for the third one but years have also passed um, where equality is much more accepted and these people's concept of what they had to deal with 10 15 years ago has now changed and they're still brought to the forefront to again have to be a hero or heroine to combat the negative. Do you have any other books that are... Well, actually, you write a lot of different types of books. I have seven books total, and they are a full range of genres. I have um, the two gay thrillers. I have two spiritual thrillers. I have two very gay adult books for that very late night, early morning thing. And then I have a children's book that is not gay in any way. Um, so I do have a wide variety, and I've written many other things that I've not published yet. But I am working on another book that I hope to have done by the end of the year. So how did you fall into writing in the first place? Ah, uh, That's a, always a fun question. Um, when I was 12 years old, and yes, I'm dating myself here, um, there was a TV show called Adam 12. It was a police show. And I really loved it. But I also enjoyed the aspect of writing. At that point in time, I actually sat down and started writing scripts for that show. And that got me really hooked into writing and stuff. But like most parents, even today, as well as before, they say, oh, that's not a real job. You need to focus in on your education. You need to get that real job. You need to earn that money. 
So I put it aside. And then something happened to me when I was um, 29 years of age that somebody had said, you, you need to write a short story about that. So I did. It got published. And that reignited my joy of writing all over again. I have so many more ideas in my mind, but sadly, I don't have the time to, to write the way I want to be able to do it, and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> yeah. I don't think a lot of folks realize that writing a book is just a small part of it because you have so much other stuff that goes with it. The marketing of it, the promotion of it, finding your audience finding your own voice as a writer and so forth. Right. And all the aspects of writing, you grow as a writer. You get better and better and better. And I've seen that with my books. But sadly, while on one hand, the World Wide Web has allowed for such huge growth in writing and publishing, it's also created a monster that people just don't get, and that's the marketing aspect, because you are competing. I think this year we're up to 1.5 million books published. That's basically 100,000 wow. books a year being added into the system. That's a lot of competition. Absolutely. Um, so when you hear of these great stories about Amazons having the top sellers, those are such rare cases. That Yes, all of us want to be that. As a writer, we want that magical bullet. We want our books to be turned into movies that earn us millions of dollars or become that top seller on the USA Today or the New York Times bestseller list. But to get there is a whole different gamut these days. It's all about the marketing and getting the word out, not only about who you are, but also about your book. And if you write many books, you have to do it for each one. Mm -hmm. So in relation to the marketing promotion of books, you're also the director and founder of the Texas Association of Authors, which is an organization that I've promoted on the show quite frequently. And we appreciate that, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in the publishing aspect, I was helping many, many people get their books published. I ended up over a five-year period helping with 60 authors getting their books published. It was a great experience, but that brought that issue of the marketing to the forefront. As a small publisher, I had not the income to properly market and sell these people and their books so that people would know about them. And that became the issue for me. It's like, how can we better find a way to market books, market the authors? And that launched the search. There's got to be groups out there that do this. And I was surprised that there wasn't. I was shocked that there was not even state organizations, you know, like the Texas government, supporting Authors. That sounds crazy. It, it is. They support um, the dance. They support music. They support um, operas. They support the theater. But they don't support Texas authors, which just shocked me. We need to band ourselves together in a community that will help support ourselves and get people to realize that we do exist. And through this, I found out through the IRS records and things of this nature, we estimate there's over 6,000 Texas published authors. There are so many names on that list. You go to a diehard reader and ask them about any of those people, they won't know 99% of them. What attracted me to the organization is, one, just your tireless effort to promote Texas authors, but also just the wide range of programs that you've created. Why don't you talk about a few of those? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time, but I will do um, the basics. Um, we have an annual event that I started last year. It's called Dear Texas, which stands for Drop Everything and Read Texas. It's intended to encourage people to read more. Um, we know that games and videos and all these other things distract us from reading. And reading is such a great way for people to get out of their mind. Say, like, you just come home from work. You've had a stressful day. You pick up a book and you start reading. When you put the book down, you're much more calm. You can think about other things that are stressing you out and find ways to resolve them or to work with them so that they're not stressful anymore. Reading has always been that. Um, now, as an author, writing is a great way to also relieve a lot of that stress. Right. Um, as in Gaff, yeah, I killed off a lot of people that were pissing me off at the time. <laughs> so it was a great release. And I know there's many authors that do that. It's very therapeutic. So we have Dear Texas, which is an annual event every April where we try to find locations to get authors into, whether it be a bookstore, 
the big chains, the small independents, grocery stores, restaurants, anywhere we can work with organizations and groups to get authors out there so the general public can meet them and learn about who they are. And then we also have um, their Super Readers Club, which is these four characters that I've created that are, encourage kids to begin reading at a young age. Go to superreaders.club, and you'll be able to see the characters as they currently are, and we're going to be posting up the new ones shortly because um, we revamped them to make them more energetic, more alive, and more... Stuff. I thought that was a great concept, the fact that you, the more you read, the greater your superpowers become. Yeah, you begin to know things, and that's really what's important. Um, the fact of you're growing your knowledge, you're growing your ability to think outside the box, outside your comfort zone, and that can be very helpful in those moments that you do have to step up and be a superhero, do that heroic thing. And having that knowledge really helps. Um, let's see, what else? We've created a museum for Texas authors. It's the only museum in the country that is like this. Um, what we are doing, it's all online right now at TexasAuthors.Institute. We have currently over 800 authors, 300 from the past 200 years, and 500 current authors that we are aware of. Um, as I mentioned before, we estimate there's over 6,000 that we're going to be adding into the system and stuff. It is free to be posted up there, but we put information about them, um, their history, their bios, and then we give the authors the opportunity, the existing ones, the opportunity to write why they wrote the book. We're not leaving it up to scholars to try to figure it out. We're giving the authors that chance to say, you know what, I wrote this book because of X, Y, Z. So it makes it more interesting. You get to connect with the authors a lot more through that. So that's a program we're working on. We do hope to have a permanent physical location built by 2036, which will be the 200th anniversary of Texas. Oh. Um, so we are definitely looking for people to help us with the architectural, the design, the feel. We know what we want. We want it to be as unique and as creative as Texas is. Um, so anybody out there who would like to help us, please reach out to us at info at TexasAuthors.Institute. I just feel that the organization does so much. We'll have to bring you back to specifically talk about the Texas Association of Authors. Definitely. I'm more than glad to. So where can readers find you specifically online? Um, I have my business website, which is <laughs> I'm going to have to spell it out for everybody. Um, it is bourgeoismedia.com. Bourgeois is B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S media.com. Um, I am a publishing consultant, so I help people who are getting into getting their books published. I guide them through the process, and it's something I really enjoy doing. And of course, in the marketing, I share all my marketing information with them, so that helps them have that extra boost. Um, of course, you have TXAuthors.com, which is Texas Association of Authors. And from there, we also have our bookstore. You can access it. All my books are available through the bookstore. I turn my money right back into the nonprofit to help support them. Not only, of course, because I believe in it, but I know it, it really helps them as a nonprofit. One of the events that we've created is the Lone Star Book Festival. This event is scheduled for September 24th and 25th in Austin. What is unique about this book festival is that it's about the independent author. It gives them the opportunity for two days to reach out to the general public and highlight their books, try to sell them, try to talk to people. It's also for small Texas independent press, too. Um, the beauty is we're going to be moving this event around the state so that more and more people get to experience it and you know have fun with it. We'll have kids' events. We'll have readings throughout the, the two days. It is free to the public, so we do encourage people to attend. Like I said, it is in Austin on September 24th and 25th of this year, and it's very inexpensive for authors to participate. Um, we work with payment plans and things of that nature. We know what it costs to be a published author, so we help with that aspect. But it should be a really great experience for everybody. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today, not only about your book, but you know, even about some of the issues that are facing the gay community right now in general. As a straight guy, gay rights is actually something that is very near and dear to me simply because any human knows how important love is and being told that you can't love the person that you love is terrible. It is, and I appreciate the time to talk about it. And with that, we'll wrap up another episode. Thank you to B. Allen Bourgeois and the members of the Texas Association of Authors. 
Don't forget about Words on the Streets, which is a new segment I'll be introducing to the podcast. It'll be fun to hit the city and figure out what everybody is reading, especially with the summer months approaching. If you're reading something interesting and want to be featured on the show, let me know. Or if you know an author that should be featured on Chapter One, reach out to me at info at ch1podcast.com. That's info at ch1podcast.com. Till next time.